Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is November 17th, 2015, and my guest is Kenneth Prendergast, the W. Allen Wallace Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. Kenneth, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks for having me. Our topic today is a bit unusual. You were part of a team that introduced market forces to how food is distributed from a national food bank to local food banks. So what was the problem to begin with that got the team involved? So the not-for-profit organization that asked us to see if we could help is called Feeding America, which is a very large not-for-profit based here in Chicago. And their part of their mandate, I should say, is to receive food typically from distributors or manufacturers, think, you know, Kraft, Walmart, whatever. And their job is to allocate um a large amount of food to regional food banks all around the country. Um, this is a pretty complicated animal. There's, you know, the food that we got involved with is about a quarter of a billion pounds of food. So think of the typical example as being a Tyson plant in Kansas says, we've got an extra truckload of frozen chicken. What do you do with it? So it's a national organization. They have to decide who gets it and what the algorithm is to decide um, how that should be assigned. And the way they tended to do it was the following, which is they have reasonably good measures of poverty levels across different parts of the country. So what you can do is rank different regional food banks in terms of their need. And what they do is they have a big long list. And essentially, if you're at the top of the list, you get offered the first thing. And if you say yes, or often if you say no, what happens is you get put to the bottom of the list after you get your thing. So essentially, it's an algorithm that's based on their perception of what an individual food bank needs. So they called us and said, look, there's a, there's some issues here. And the issues largely were on the demand side, which now, is... Before, before we get to this, can we just work sure. a little bit on the how sure. the old system worked? So uh, you said they use the uh, poverty rates in different areas to determine to determine what? So there's... Determine need. So if I'm at the top of the list now, it's, it's my turn. Yep. Is the question then how much I get uh, of what's at the top of the how, let's just say I'm at the top of the list. I'm a Washington DC food bank. And gotcha. I, what what is on the top in terms of product? Okay, so the way it works is that on any given day, there's probably across the country, let's say fifty truckloads of food. So a, a truckload of food is probably say thirty thousand pounds of food. So what happens is Feeding America has 50 truckloads of food. And based on everything that's happened up to now, you as Washington, D.C. is at the top of the list. What they will do is they will offer you one of those truckloads. And if I were a different place, I might get a half a truckload? No, truckloads basically, there's an indivisibility really, which is you need a truck to bring something there. At times, what will happen is two small food banks will get together and share a load. But for the most part, you will get a truckload of food, which then goes to your distribution center. And you then assign it to your local church, your local community center or whatever. So that's, did you say 30,000 pounds? Yeah, that would be the typical truckload. So that's that sounds like a lot of food. So I get 50, it's I'm going to call food. it tons So I because it sounds more fun. Uh, yeah. It's 15 tons, right? Yeah. I did that yeah. right. So 15 tons of food come my way. And of course, I don't get to choose what's in the that particular truckload or do I? Very little. In the old, we're in the no old days. We're talking about the old in days. In the old days. Very little choice. And that was largely the problem. The caricatured example that we would deal with on our committee was – where a food bank director in Idaho would say, look, I have a warehouse full of potatoes and you just give me more potatoes. I don't need potatoes. I need something else. And even though there were 50 trucks available that day, I didn't even get to choose among the 50 trucks? Rarely. Rarely, okay. essentially. What they did is they assigned them to you. Okay. So that was the luck of the draw. And after I accepted it, or if I didn't, because I really couldn't do anything with them in that case of potatoes, say, I went back to the bottom of the list. How many people are on the list? How many food banks were being supplied? 215. 
Okay. So they're pretty, as you say, they're all over the country. And is it, it's always going to get trucked to me? No, I have to pay for trucking. Okay. So essentially the way it works is individual food banks pay for the most part for transportation. Occasionally there are subsidies given for transportation, but the cost to me is that I have to go get it. And, but it's always trucked. It's not uh, flown or. Correct. Okay. Correct. So that's, um, that's a pretty amazing thing. So every day in the old system, this is pre-2005, if I remember correctly from your article. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, of course, we'll put a link up to. Uh, every day before 2015, 50 trucks headed out from Chicago, centrally situated, to – Not from Chicago. No, oh. not from Chicago. From wherever the manufacturer was. Correct. Thank so the you. manufacturer could be in Oregon. They could be in Maine. They could be in wherever. So that was – so part of what they were trying to do was also match in terms of geography. Matching meaning which of the 50 trucks. So if I'm a, exactly. if I'm a Florida. So if, I'm in, if I'm in Louisiana, it doesn't make sense to offer me stuff from Alaska. Okay, because it's just not going to be worth it for me. It's too too expensive. Yeah. Exactly. So, now, so, one thing I should be absolutely clear about is that um, one thing that Feeding America felt and still feels is extremely important is that the system be seen as fair and transparent. So... You know, there are situations where they could use their discretion to give you something that they didn't offer to somebody else, but that sometimes led to hard feelings. So one of the things that they tried to do was they wanted a system which was very transparent for all the food banks. And at times that meant they couldn't use their discretion in ways that we might think, well, well, it could have made a food bank better off because they were afraid that it would be seen as unfair. And one more thing to clarify before we talk about the the reform Uh where you said a Tyson's factory might have some leftover frozen chicken breasts, why would they be giving those away? So talk about some of the reasons that uh, that Feeding America would, would be able to receive uh, a donation of uh, a significant. These are large, isn't it? Somebody dropping off a few cans. These are exactly. large corporate sources, typically. So these what are, are some of the reasons? Largely, it's inventory management. You know that you know f- firms. You know, whether it's producers, whether it's distributors, make guesses as to what demand is likely to be. Often they're wrong. You know, there are certain products that are they think are going to sell, but they don't. That would be one thing. Second thing in the context of produce is the size of the crop. You know, sometimes crops are a lot bigger than we think they're going to be. So they don't have use for them largely in terms of inventory and storage. And the the final reason actually is, and this is a non-trivial issue with respect to dairy products, meat products, fish, and for produce, is the danger of spoilage, right. which is Thank stuff is getting close to its sell-by date. So for many of these reasons, that's sort of where the donations come from. They get a charitable deduction for that? They do. And what determines the size of that deduction? I never thought about this. What's the amount they can take? I assume it's some kind of market value? You're well beyond my area of expertise on that one, I'm afraid, Rob. Okay. I wish I knew, but that's not my question, end of the deal. Right? It is, yes, very much so. And some of it can be corporate goodwill. They're hoping they're going to get some... Absolutely. absolutely. And in fact, let me make one thing very clear because it'll be important for the way that the new market-based system has worked, which is there are many, many cases where donors will not give it to Feeding America and say, you assign it how you see fit, but rather they will specify that it has to go to a particular food bank. And usually that's the local food depository or the local food bank. So there's a lot of direct donations that actually occur in addition to these non-direct donations. And that's very important for how the market works. And that's for community develop, community relations. Of course. uh, course. Feeling of efficiency on the part of the donor probably as well. Yes, I mean, we all all have preferences for local stuff. You know, we live in these neighborhoods. Yep. So that system, obviously, you know, if you think about it for – 10 minutes or 30 seconds, uh, depending on your background in economics, you'd say, well, it's not going to work so well, but it's all, quote, free, meaning it's donated without a a charge. There is this trucking charge, so that causes some issues. But in general, you know, don't look a a gift horse in the mouth. This is uh, a pretty good deal. So what was the impetus to do something to change it? What was the – obviously, there was discontent. There was discontent for 50 years or however long – it existed, but what do you think provoked the dramatic change that you ended up being part of? I don't think – so I was part of a group of 14 that was involved in the changeover. And I think 
it would be wrong to say that there was a groundswell of a desire for a major change when we got together. Uh, I think the general sentiment was that, you know, Feeding America is trying to do lots of things simultaneously. They're trying to make sure that the poorest areas get the most food. They're trying to introduce a system that's seen as transparent and fair. And both of those things were largely done through the old system. But the thing that it didn't really satisfy, which is where I would say grumbling occurred rather than widespread discontent, was that there was very little ability of the food banks to tailor the loads that they got to their individual needs. And they, they did see that as important. And they saw it as important on two dimensions. One, I would say, is transitory, which is you happen to have got yogurt already. You don't need more yogurt. In fact, getting yogurt could be terrible because you don't have refrigeration to basically keep it uh, from spoiling. So I would describe those as kind of transitory um, issues associated with demand. They wanted something that would allow them not to get the yogurt if they already had it. Probably an even more important thing, though, is actually has to do with permanent differences in demand across neighborhoods or different food banks, I should say, which is there are some food banks that have a lot of other sources of food. You know, they manage to get donate, direct donations either from Feeding America or from other sources. And those are in sort of the language of food banking called food rich areas. So one of the things that they really wanted to do was try to level the playing field in some sense whereby those areas that were not food rich might get access to more food. So it was those permanent and transitory demand side things that they kind of wanted to change. And there was another issue I think which is, has turned out to be important too, which is often the sentiment was that at times donations would be turned down because there was a fear they couldn't be placed quickly. And maybe we could set up a system whereby by making the system more liquid, we could get more donations. So. People entered into this process, I think, believing that we would tweak an algorithm in some way that might make things a little bit better on those dimensions. And really, it was only through a very long conversation that really took a year did we end up converging on something that looks closer to what you know, economists would consider a market. But when you said that some of the food banks were not food rich, so they were in, say, more rural areas or areas, more, I guess, more likely that there wasn't a large food distributor already nearby that would make a, a donation. That would be fair. That 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 Feeding America felt uncomfortable using discretion uh, to hand out to to solve that problem. Of course, they could have. They could, but I think they were very reluctant to do something that could be perceived as non-transparent. Their favor think, to stir. Uh, and that's that's it's a big. I mean. As economists, we're often very good at sort of complaining about centrally administered situa systems, you know, bureaucratic kind of things. But, you know, th they were walking a fairly fine line here, I think. Meaning? Meaning that they were trading off what they saw as efficient use of their discretion against the perception that they could be showing some favoritism towards somebody. Sure. Um, that makes sense. So after about a year, you said you worked on it. And we should just mention Feeding America used to be called something else. It was called America's Second Harvest. In fact, it was America's Second Harvest while we were actually involved in this process. And it's been renamed since. So if you Google this and find, as I did, some other stories, it's, it's the same story. So, Correct. So um, what, what was your proposal? So we as a group met together for, you know, the best part of a year on and off. And I think relatively early in the process, we raised the possibility that, um, and this came initially, I think, from the academics here, we raised the possibility that we could think of using some market-based system, not using real money, which they felt very uncomfortable with, but rather using some kind of constructed money, which we called shares. So those conversations, or that suggestion, I would say, was initially responded to somewhat skeptically. And I would say it in the following sense, which is many of the people who run food banks feel that they are catering to people that have been marginalized. They perceive it as marginalized by the market and they were reluctant to do this in the context of the food banking industry because largely they thought it may offer advantages to certain food banks, particularly the big ones relative to the smaller ones. So for example, you know, Chicago Food Depository has many, many employees. 
you're in rural West Virginia, you have very few, so it may give advantages to that one relative to the other. But at the end of a year's conversation with a whole series of checks and balances, everybody got on the same page. And then an important part of this is that we, meaning the committee, did not have the right to mandate what the institution would do. Rather, the decision was actually, a vote was actually held by all 215 food banks. And it was the food bank directors who did all the heavy lifting in terms of persuading the other food bank directors to sign on for this. So before we get into the the details of what you actually proposed, which are fascinating, uh, how did you educate those directors about what they were about to get into, given that most of them weren't economists? Most of them, uh, I think in your paper, you have one of them quoted as saying, hey, I'm a socialist. This doesn't (laughs) smell right to me. Um, I don't like this. Uh, How did you get them to vote for it? So I would say, first off, education happened on both sides. Um, I learned at least as much from them as they learned from me, I suspect. Um, I think it was not hard to educate them on the benefits of choice. Um, The harder part was showing them that choice needn't sacrifice assignment based on need. And a lot of that discussion and a lot of the slightly more complicated issues had to do with money supply, strangely enough, which is one of the things that we have done as part of this process is we construct this fake currency. So let's say I'm the person in charge of the fake currency. I have to decide two things. One is how much of this fake currency do I print? And secondly, Who gets it? So a lot of the discussions were about how how much much we print (laughs) and how much exactly and how much each gets it. And I think we relatively quickly got to the point of 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 everybody understanding that we could assign this fake currency in a way where the most needy would be on our metric, the richest. Okay, and we could sort that problem out. And much of the education at my end was they're on the ground. They know how this thing works day to day. They kept throwing counterfactuals at me like hang on, we set up this auction and you have a big food bank like like Los Angeles staring at the screen all the time. You have somebody in rural West Virginia who's so busy, if they're lucky, they check it once a day. How do we make sure we don't get an advantage for LA relative to the rural West Virginia case? So there were a series of things like that that actually cropped up. Another good example of something that cropped up is that um, a hugely important thing for Feeding America is donor relations. They have to keep donors happy. So one way of annoying a donor is by either refusing something or even worse, saying you're going to take it and then two days later it's still sitting on their dock. So one of the other issues that we spent a fair bit of time talking about was how do we move what's called hard-to-move product? And the way we did it largely was by subsidies. We have negative prices as part of this. So, you know, to say that, you know, I, we educated them on the merits of markets may be true in a very broad brush sense, but certainly I learned as much from them about how to design a bunch of safeguards. And, you know, I would say the following, which is the idea that sometimes you can use a constructed form of currency to do better than a central assignment is, you know, a relatively straightforward idea in, in a textbook. broad uh, textbook. Exactly. Almost. For there some are, people, there if you are, got the right textbook. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But there are very, very, very few examples where it's actually happened. And I think yep. the lesson I learned from this is that, you know, the, the hardest part here is actually sorting out the details, you know, to get it to work. And I think we've been lucky in that we've managed to do it. But for that, I relied on both the staff or we relied on both the staff and the, even more so, I would say, the directors of these food banks. Well, the best markets emerge. Uh, you, this is a special kind of market. It's a you, you had an original top down solution or Feeding America allocated stuff with their own rules it's still a top-down solution, but they decentralized a big chunk of it, which is how people – how the mechanism by which Feeding America decided who got how much and what got changed to a, a system that has more incentives. So it's not, quote, a real market, but it's got market elements, which is often the case in these kind of markets. And as we've talked about many times on this program, those kind of markets, because they don't bring all the other pieces with it, often fail or have very unattractive – uh, attributes, sure. but this one actually sure. seems to be fairly successful. Before we get to the actual reform in more detail about how it actually was implemented, 
Uh, I want to ask a question about the the decision making process. You said you had a vote among the two hundred and fifteen food banks. Is that right? They did. Yes. It's so one. The, 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 the two hundred and fifteen food bank directors voted on whether to implement this change. So I assume it was one food bank, one vote. To the best of my knowledge, that's correct. So that obviously meant that you had to, even if you didn't want to, you had to create a system where a lot of the, the small, I assume that the top 20% of the food banks are something close to 80% of the food that gets handed out in America by food banks. I assume, as you said, there's some giant ones in LA and then smaller ones in rural uh, West Virginia. So I, I assume that the one food bank, one vote meant that whatever system you you did choose had to be very attractive to the smaller food banks. It couldn't cater to the larger, more Absolutely. powerful ones, correct? Absolutely. Now, it did pass overwhelmingly, so I think we managed to persuade not just the median voter <laughs> here, but almost all of them. Good. And, you know, as I say, it was the food bank directors. Like, you mentioned the one food bank director. This is His name is John Arnold from um, Michigan. He was probably the person that was most resistant to moving towards a market-based system. He became its greatest advocate almost by the end. And I think his views managed to, I suspect, sway quite a lot of people. I wasn't in the room, but I would be willing to bet that was true. Now, didn't you have some kind of simulation beforehand or is that once they voted? So after they voted, what we did was we had a three-month simulation so that people would get used to the notion of bidding. So cool. Okay, let's talk about how the system actually works. So one of sure. the things you did was it wasn't a – you're going to auction off those 50 trucks now. And, of Correct. course, one of the punchlines of the story, which I'm going to reveal early, is that uh, it's, if I get this right, it was more than 50 trucks after a few years because the system was able to attract more donations for whatever reasons, possibly because it was more attractive. But yeah. uh, So this 50-plus trucks that are now being allocated, they used to be – you're at the top of the list, you were offered a truck, take it or leave it, and then you move to the bottom of the list. How did it work now? So the way it works now is the following. So you log on in the morning, okay? So there's a website. So everybody logs on, and you will see the 50 truckloads that are there on a given day. Um, you will have the opportunity to bid our fake money, which we call shares. Uh, it works in a standard auction setting. You pay the price that you bid. Um, the way it works, though, is there is not a continuous auction. There's a sealed bid auction that occurs twice a day. So at 12 o'clock and at 4 o'clock central time, the market basically clears and you can't see the bids of other people. It's sealed bid. And the reason that we did that was because we didn't want to set up a system that could benefit the ability of somebody to wait until the last second and like snipe as in eBay because there was a sense that this would benefit the larger food banks relative to the smaller ones. so Because they can have that dedicated day, person sitting at the terminal. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So twice a day, seal bid. So market closes at 12 o'clock. You know, within five minutes, you get an email telling you whether you've got the good or not. You can then re-equilibrate, decide what to bid on the second auction during the day. But it's In the, a, the 12 o'clock auction, when it ends, those trucks are gone. They're all all 50 or whatever, 25 or whatever it is, they're They've done for, right? They've been sold, and, exactly. And they now, start off on their missions, ideally, and then 4 o'clock, there's another group that, that's available. Correct. That's exactly right. So a um, few additional things with respect to this, which is um, you can actually do what's called joint bidding. So one of the things we talked about is these large trucks. If you're a small food bank, you may not need a whole truck. So what can happen is food banks can join together to jointly bid, fractional bids as we call them, basically on a truck. So that's one thing. Second thing is that another thing that was felt to be important was that the smaller food banks would have enough funds to potentially buy the most desired objects. So one of the other things that we have is a credit system whereby the smaller food banks, the bottom half basically, can access credit, which means they're given additional shares and they pay it back over a relatively short period of time, but it's a way of making all loads accessible to them. And then the other thing that has happened is that um, because one of the problems or one of the difficulties I would say with the old system was this hard to move product. So what we do is we allow negative shares, negative prices, I should say, 
for individual units. So you could actually receive shares for taking certain things, which would free up your funds to buy something else as well. Which now, would make that, the donors happy now that it wasn't waste, sitting around exactly, being wasted. Exactly. And, uh, it's a way of trying to basically pay people to keep donors happy. That's now, essentially how it works. Now, I have to say, I think the word shares, choosing that word to describe the uh, unit of currency is a genius uh, <laughs> bit of, of choice there. Uh, loves might have been better, but I, I think shares is about as good as it gets. Uh, so you didn't well, choose – it's monopoly money. It's fake money, but it's not called funny money or dollars or, or mm -hmm. green dollars or food dollars. Uh, just out of curiosity, was was that somebody's idea that was a, like a eureka moment or just kind of – somebody just kind of pick it was, in the – I believe that was one of our food banking members who came up with that one. <laughs> That's a now, actually, I would say a more general point, which is share has this notion of ownership. Yep. And in fact, and that sharing. sense of ownership, <laughs> yes, that sense of ownership and sharing was key to actually getting a different issue to work, which is one of the concerns that many of the staff and food banking members raised was the following, which was suppose that um, – there are some food banks that are, you know, food rich. Food rich means I have all the staples. You know, I have enough tinned vegetables. I have enough produce. From I have my enough other drinks, sources. I have enough dairy from other sources. That what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold my shares back and I'm only going to bid on the most desirable things. So the most desirable things, that's the, the caricatured examples we would talk about were peanut butter and frozen chicken. Like peanut butter is great, ton of nutrition value relative Last to its forever. transportation costs. Lasts forever, exactly. So the concern was that um, a big food bank, let's take Los Angeles or Chicago, would hold their shares back. And what they would do is they'd spend all of their money on the really expensive and stuff. They'd always the get it. They'd always Just get like it. Just like the rich get all the TVs. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, Go ahead. Yeah. But, but I understand that's the kind of concern people would have realistically. Yeah. What actually turned out to be extremely important was the following, which is the way the money supply works is that whenever – People spend, so suppose Los Angeles or Chicago spends 30,000 shares on a truckload of frozen chicken. That 30,000 shares gets given back to everybody that evening at midnight. Except, so, except for them. Or no, no they, or get they get their, a prorated they get, share. They get a prorated share too. Okay. So they they have to, they get back one over 215 or whatever of their of their the money that they pay. So um that, it turned out, gave individual food banks the sense that they're the sellers of this food. They're the owners of the food. And if Los Angeles decides to pay through the nose for a truckload of chicken, we get their money. And that's a good thing. Well, it reminds, me, actually, a little bit of, it reminds me a little bit of the luxury tax in baseball, right? So yeah, if, if the Yankees exactly. or the Red Sox uh, spend more than a certain level, uh, it's true they have an advantage as a big market or popular fan base or rich owners, whatever it is, but at least some of that largesse gets spread back around to the other teams. Exactly. Now that's, I mean, in some sense, there's a little bit of that that's pure psychology. Yes, it is. <laughs> but there's yeah. another part that has actually turned out to be hugely important, which is the general equilibrium effects, which is if it turns out that the food rich tend to focus their expenditures on the very expensive stuff, in equilibrium, it makes the staples really cheap. Yeah. And that opens up a lot of food for the food poor places. And that's really been one of the huge implications, I think, of the market. So I, I want to understand the allocation of shares a little bit better. Uh, you didn't just create a fake currency. Um, and, of course, the, before I say this, before I get into that, the, the total amount of currency in some dimension is unimportant. It's only going to determine the, the price right. level, the average price of, of various goods. But so once you've set that, which is just a mechanical choice that, to make sure there's enough zeros to make it easy to calculate, and I'm sure you thought about all that. But does that you didn't get a per rate? Everybody didn't get one two hundred fifteenth. Absolutely not. The allocation that you get of these shares, simplest way to think about it is, it's how many poor people there are in your catchment area relative to the total number of poor people that there are in the United States. So if you happen to be in a particularly large area or you happen to be particularly poor, you will get a larger share of the of the shares, as we call them. But aren't there more food banks in the larger areas, too? 
True, it's, that's why we say catchment areas. Okay. So essentially, you each have your own catchment area. So it could be that, for example, San Francisco has three, in which case your, your shares will be divided by three. So you went from a system of your allocation being in pounds, which is remarkably blunt and weight-driven. So there's heavier foods that probably everybody wants or don't doesn't want. There are light foods that are fabulous or awful. But instead, you now went to a place you could actually – choose what you bought. That's correct. So that's the, the the shares. So each bank has a certain amount of shares. They can go online once a day to buy stuff uh, in by auction. And I, I thought I saw in an article that actually you didn't pay you what you bid. You paid the second highest bid. Did that change? <laughs> yeah, that or was that change. error by the journalists? No, no, actually. So that actually changed from <clears throat> the end document which the committee put together to what was ultimately implemented and people <clears throat> for reasons that have remained somewhat opaque a lot of people like to pay what they bid and in order to facilitate this through the election process and um, we switched back to a first price bidding uh, rather there, than a second price auction why did you talk about the economics for a second of the second price bid being uh, attractive why would you have proposed that at all the appeal of the second price auction is largely it cuts out strategic bidding. In much wider set of circumstances, it'll cut out strategic bidding compared to a first price auction. Um, ex post, I don't think it's turned out to be that important. There are just so many bidders and there are so there's so many opportunities for substitution both across time and across food that I think the strategic elements have been minimal. But conceptually, we thought the second price bid would be cleaner, but it didn't resonate with many of the food bank directors. So I don't know if I'm doing the math right here, uh, but in the old days when you allocated uh, food by getting in line essentially and then getting a fixed mm-hmm. amount of pounds depending mm-hmm. on your, your need uh, defined by poverty area and other factors. In the old days, every day, say 50 trucks of food were allocated to 215 uh, to 50 of the 215 banks. So mm-hmm. – once you got your truckload that day, if you got it, you went to the bottom of the line and at, at back of the line and you took another roughly four days before you'd get another delivery from right, right. Uh, started from the uh, Feeding America. How did that change? Because you could lose every auction now if you're not, you know, you have bad luck, you're not good at it. Uh, what was, was there any pattern after, of course, there's always learning factors. It takes a while for the market to settle down. It takes a while for people to figure out what is a reasonable price for pasta versus chicken. But once things sort of, and I'd be interested in how long that took in your perception, but once things did settle down, how often did you win? So on average, you still win just as much as you would before. Um, you think. You think. Um, but, the, but it depends on what you bid for. I mean, that's sort of the natural thing. But I, let me do the two parts. So first is how long did it take? I would say, let me start by doing the following, which is within the first seven months, almost everybody had at least won something. So 97% of people had won something within the first six or seven months. So people were engaged. Having said that, I think there was a lot of learning that happened at the beginning. And one of the ways in which I can see this, or we can see this, is we talked about these negative prices. Um, We also, one of the other things is that there's a lot of stuff that sells for zero. You know, a lot of produce actually sells for zero. They don't allow negative prices for produce. Zero Um, meaning you only have to pay the transport cost then. Exactly, exactly. So first two years, if you do negative prices, about 10 to 12% of all loads sold for negative prices. And it was largely because a lot of people weren't bidding. If you look two years on, over the succeeding five years, it's gone down to about 4%. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's kind of converged. Zero, non-positive prices, so include all the zeros. The first year we did it, 50% of things sold for zero. Wow. Now it's converged, it's very steady, it's converged to about 20%. So that there appears to be, you know, there was a certain amount of reticence to bid on stuff, but now it appears that everybody's up and running. And now in terms of, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. So, so now if you look now, um, the main thing that's actually happening now is, not that people are unlucky, they don't get a bunch of stuff. You, I mean, you can bid every single day, you know? So it's not like if you don't get something today, you're out of luck, you just change your bid a little bit for tomorrow, you know? So that's not usually the main sorting that's actually happened. The main sorting that seems to be happening is 
some people have decided to become what we call the bottom feeders, which is they want a lot of food and they'd spend a lot of pounds of food, I should say. And what they do is they tend to buy relatively cheap things. And then there are other people who are sort of sorting up the quality dimension and saying, look, we want the peanut butter, we want the chicken, we want the cereal. We've no interest in the stuff down the bottom because we already have that stuff. So cool. Uh, do you have any feel, this is maybe again outside your uh, expertise, but do you have any feel for how the variety of food changes day to day? Obviously, there's seasonal differences. Mm -hmm. uh, there's seasonal differences in demand, surely as well. I mean, winter and summer are going to be different, I assume, and especially in certain areas, um, more in Chicago than than uh, Southern California. But on a if it's a March day, and I didn't get the potatoes I wanted or the pasta or the cereal, whatever it is, is that likely to be available tomorrow? Is tomorrow just another random okay. set of stuff? Depends what it is. So here's sort of the, the thing, which is um, one of the things we've looked at is we've looked at what the distribution of different kinds of food is. Certain kinds of food don't come up that often. Fish, for example. If you really want fish and there's something on the market today, it could be three weeks before you see fish again in anywhere that's close to your area. By contrast, if you want carrots, you know, you just wait till tomorrow, there's going to be either carrots or something that's a close substitute for carrots. So it very much depends on the kind of food. In fact, probably the single most desired thing, if you look at prices, is pasta. Pasta doesn't come up that often. Hmm. So, you know, that's, that's one that kind of, if you see it today, you probably got to do it. Okay. But the other thing I will say is the following, which is, the, I think part of the reason why this system, and I believe it has worked, has worked, is the following, which is, um, it's like an infinitely repeated game, which is you can bid on something, but if you don't get it, you just wait till tomorrow and bid for something. Yeah. So your money still has value, your fake money still has value, which is one of the difficulties you get with these kind of fake money systems. But the other thing I will say is, there's loads of variability in supply on a given day or a given week. But you look over a month or over two months, then you're going to get a lot of kind of consistency in what the supply is going to be. And what food banks are good at is they can substitute across time, which is, well, we didn't get chicken for this time. But, you know, as long as we get chicken or pork or hamburgers next time, that's okay. Because yeah, it's, so kind of, it's protein. It's protein. It's not exactly. that they have to they, fill I mean, out the menu of, to make it match whatever they promised. It's, they want exactly. protein. They want carbohydrates. They want fat, it, whatever it is. In, in our language, this is what we call a hedonic which is there are quality differences across yeah. different kinds of foods, but we can kind of aggregate these things up. Like fish is not that unique because there are substitutes for fish yeah. in terms of nutrition. Uh, talk about maroon pounds, uh, which is fascinating, and how that um, changed when the new system was put in place. So one of the things that we were interested in is obviously efficient use of food. And your first order thought is, use the food that Feeding America or at the time America's Second Harvest has in an efficient way. But one thing we also wanted to do was use their other sources of food in an efficient way. So let's take the example I gave before, which is you already have yogurt sitting in your warehouse. Suppose a local distributor offered you more yogurt. All else equal, you'd have to say, look, sorry, we haven't got a fridge. We're not going to be able to move this thing, so can't take it. Now what we have done through this system is we allow you to take that, that truckload of yogurt, put it on the market itself, our market we call the choice system. You put it on the choice system, you get the returns from that. So in some sense what it is, it's an attempt to increase supply, but it's increasing supply not from the usual sources of food that Feeding America would get, but from your own sources of food. So it's actually resulted in, if you look on average over the you know, the five or six years after the system was introduced, on average, it's about 12 million pounds of food. Extra. Extra food, exactly. Going through the system per what? Per year, 12 per million year. pounds of food per year, exactly. And um, the so other thing that, that kind of, sorry, go ahead. Well, what I was going to say is what's powering that, it was just again to clarify. So if I'm a, a food bank in, um, in Florida, and I have – I get lots of oranges, so I never want to take oranges. Uh, I might decide to take some of those oranges, put them on the system, and get some shares to buy some more of other stuff, right? So it's a – Absolutely right. It's a uh, sharing economy kind of uh, – it, it's a brilliant <laughs> – just a brilliant idea. So before, yeah, all you were doing was allocating the donations made directly to Feeding America. But once you had the system in place – 
why not uh, allow donations from local places to local food banks be put into that national economy that you've created? And presumably that encourages local donors who aren't part of Feeding America to donate locally because they know it'll get used even if normally it might just get turned down because they've already got plenty because they've got that natural source. Is that accurate? That's, that's That was the hope which seems to have occurred. Um, you know, it certainly has occurred. One One thing I will say, though, and it's sort of related to your example about oranges, which is if you look at the, I told you the 12 million pounds of food tends to be put on the choice system. If you look at the quality of food that gets placed through these maroon pounds, it's about twice as high as the average quality in the normal system. And part of that is that food like certain kinds of produce, broccoli, for example, tends not to sell for very high prices. So people tend not to put it on. Instead, what they will usually do with those kind of foods is they'll share them informally with somebody else. So, you know, you're in Jacksonville. So what you'll do is you'll call up the guy in um, Orlando and say, look, you want my oranges? Because truthfully, you're not going to get very many shares for oranges, but you will get a lot of shares if you have a truckload of cereal. So quality adjusted, the number of maroon pounds is probably about twice as high as the 12 million pounds. Can we talk about peanut butter for a second? Um, sure. Because you said pasta doesn't sell. You said pasta was does uh, sell. Does sell. One of the desirable. reasons it sells is it lasts forever, like Correct. like peanut butter. But the fact that it lasts forever means, in general, one would think it wouldn't get a lot of donations for, of it because this, you're not worried about spoilage. You're not worried about it going bad. That's who's, absolutely right. And I would <laughs> yeah. also think that peanut butter. Who's there? Are only a handful of peanut butter manufacturers. Why would they ever be making donations to Feeding America? You know, are they. You said, is it inventory control? I don't know. It doesn't seem like it'd be a big problem to gauge the national demand for peanut butter so that the national producers like uh, Jeff or Peter Pan, um, you'd think it'd be easy for them and they wouldn't be making donations. Or is there something else mm -hmm. going on there with peanut butter that it, I don't know about? It's a good question. Peanut butter is such a rare product that <laughs> perhaps you're absolutely right on this one. Uh, the more common, I would say if you wanted... A good, which is very valued, which actually comes up relatively frequently, it's actually cereal. Mm -hmm. So, and those have quite high storage costs. Like peanut butter doesn't have huge storage costs. I mean, for manufacturers. Yeah. So it may be that storage costs are sort of non-trivial for manufacturers for things like cereal boxes. So uh, let's talk about uh, the overall reaction. So, you know, as an economist, my first thought when you tell me this system, why don't you tell me that, that the software worked and that the interface was fairly understandable, attractive, easy to use. You tell me there's a lot of bidding going on. I'm pretty confident that what's going to result is a better allocation. Uh, so one of the natural effects is you get what you want if you're a local food bank instead of getting what you're stuck with. And so that's pretty obvious. Um, you could It's hard to measure, as you point out, one of your articles. But it's an interesting piece to this, which somebody might not think of, which is the supply effect. So every uh, day you had roughly 50 truckloads to allocate, Feeding America did. But mm -hmm. one of the ideas of this was to improve the attractiveness of giving to Feeding America because donors would now know that it would be used more effectively. So my question is, so one of the things you, you claim in the paper is that there was a supply effect that they were able to attract more donations. I want you to talk about that. And if you know anything directly about how Feeding America marketed their system to potential donors differently now that this was in place. Because the other thing that strikes me about is it's pretty complicated. Usually when you make a reform like this, one of the challenges is, you know, the economist comes up with this really clever system and everybody goes like, I don't get it. It's too complicated. So you made it transparent and simple enough that you could sell it. Did Feeding America use that as a selling point to donors? And do you think that's why their supplies increased and by how much? So I think it's an excellent question. Um, I, I think supply has increased. I mean, if you look around the time of the change, just to give us sort of a very narrow window, from about 2000 to 2004, you know, just before the change was introduced, I would say about 200 to 220 million pounds of food was being assigned through this. Within the first seven months, I would say, of the new change, we were getting 60, 70 million extra pounds and that's largely maintained. The only caveat I have to give to that is we got 
hit, we meaning Feeding America, got hit by the financial crisis. The financial crisis both affected supply and demand. Yep. So there was a blip that happened around 2008, but the numbers still look very good, I would say. And then on top of that, you also have these maroon pounds that are coming in, these, this food that's being brought in from different sources. So I think in terms of aggregate supply, I think it's been um, quite a bonus, I would say. But the maroon in pounds... Terms of, sorry, go ahead. Uh, the maroon pounds, by the way, they're called maroon pounds because you, you gave a designation of yellow and blue for the other kinds of food that came through the system. Um, it's nothing about the color of the food. It's not about um, Not at all. In fact, it's a, it's, a much, <laughs> it's a much cheesier outcome, which is maroon is the color of the University of Chicago. Oh, right. Go, exactly. go maroons. Um, <laughs> exactly. Uh, my alma mater. Um, so in terms of... In terms of how Feeding America has marketed, the honest answer is I don't know. If you ask me to guess, I would be willing to bet that a lot of the change has not occurred through explicitly marketing to donors that this will go to better end use. I could be wrong. I suspect a lot of it comes from Feeding America now accepting donations that they previously wouldn't have taken because they were afraid that they were not Correct. going to be able to move it. Yeah. But now the market's more liquid, so I can imagine in their minds, and I'm imputing here, I can imagine in their minds them thinking, look, this, someone will take it. Like, people take stuff, they'll take it. You know, especially now that we have these negative shares. And I, I guess just as a technicality, the, the maroon pounds, the locally donated uh, pounds that end up on the national distribution market through the share system... They weren't really an augmenting, fully augmenting of supply, increase in supply because they were just not being measured before as part of the system. But they were going to right. people and feeding them. And it's also imaginable that local food banks are now accepting more uh, donations than they did before because they can do something with them. Uh, so there is some Absolutely. increase, but it's probably not 12 million pounds. Um, Absolutely. I have no idea what the alternative use for those 12, pounds, yeah. 12 million pounds would have been. So, Le more, le less than their use is, I guess, what we know because they're choosing to put it on. So as I said and before and you point out in your paper, you know, as economists, we think, well, this can be better. Talk about some of the anecdotal reactions you got from executives, you know, it was five, six, seven months, year, two year into the program after they'd uh, gotten the hang of it. Uh, what was some of the anecdotal evidence you got that this was a, an improvement? I think the overwhelming response, I would say, has been this is working as you had hoped it would work. You know, we get the pick. You know, the one, uh, I would say the one thing we really worried about was the following, which was there would be some particularly smaller food banks that either would be so intimidated by this, they just wouldn't get involved. So one thing that we allowed them to do was to delegate bidding to Feeding America itself. Just give a broad mandate for what you want. We'll do it for you. No food bank has chosen to do that. Okay. Second thing we did was we spent a lot of time setting up what was effectively an appeals committee, which is if you think you've been screwed by this system, okay, what you can do is you can make an appeal and we'll change the way that we're assigning shares to you. Now, it, it was set up in two senses. One was for like transitory things that could happen. So take an extreme case, which is Katrina hits New Orleans. How do you make sure New Orleans gets loads more food? There's nothing in the formula that deals with New Orleans. Right. So second thing would be a more common example would be like, suppose a local plant closes, big increase in demand. So we set up this apparatus largely to deal with these exceptional circumstances. As Feeding America tells me, this committee has never, ever, ever met because nobody has ever complained. It's pretty so amazing. Instead, so instead, I think the really fundamental upshot of this is that unlike the old system, any food bank that wants food on a given day can get food on a given day because you can buy inexpensive food very inexpensively. As long as you have a truck, you can get it. And I think that sort of availability has kind of overwhelmed any other issue that might have come up as a result of a lot of the problems. The second thing we worried about a little bit is that maybe the small guys wouldn't know how to bid, you know, so they wouldn't be able to work it out and the big guys would know how to bid because they do it more frequently. But I have to empirically, I haven't empirically tested that yet, but it doesn't seem to have been a major concern. Now, I just heard you say something I think I said I didn't fully understand. So when we talk about 50 truckloads of food, in my mind, <laughs> it's just sitting on the truck waiting to go, but that's not actually what happens. So you're saying no, you no. have to go get it, meaning you have to rent a truck, you have to... They usually own trucks. 
they own trucks. So what they will do is they'll either ro- own or rent, and they will send it to wherever the donor is. So that's the sense in which they pay the transportation. They literally have to go get it. So it's not Correct. like uh, they get billed after the delivery. Correct. Okay. Correct. Uh, let's talk for a second about inflation. So uh. obviously if um, if for whatever reason, uh, let's say uh, we got uh, – an increase in the supply of donations over time, uh, that would have an effect on the average bid um, or vice versa. If there was an increase Mm -hmm. uh, in the demand for food because of the financial crisis, that would normally increase the prices overall. Um, But you wanted to hold the chain. You wanted there to be zero inflation. So did you change over time the total? why, Why was that, number one? And number two, why uh, did you change the total amount of shares that were allocated um, daily? So the way it works is that um, uh, let me start with objectives. So the objective was that in order to help people to bid, seeing the history of prices for similar goods would give you some notion as to what to bid. So. This was, I mean, a value to everybody, I can imagine, but it was felt to be of a special value to the smaller food banks in the following sense, which is, suppose I'm a small food bank and I really want a truckload of cereal. I haven't bid on cereal for like a year and a half, so I'm not really sure what the hell I should be paying for it. But what you can do on the website is you basically click link, and when you click that link, it says, this is what the history of prices is for cereal over the last five years. And what we wanted to do was set up a system whereby by observing that history of prices, it gave you a reasonable instinct for what you should be bidding. Now, as you say, um, one of the things that can actually change the price level, okay, forget relative prices, but change the price level as if suppose the quantity of shares didn't change, but the amount of food doubled, okay, then prices are going to get cut in half, all else equal. And that would be confusing for people. So one of the things because they that would did was, just like life, they wouldn't know like whether life. cereal had gotten cheaper because nobody wanted it anymore. There was a lot of it, or whether everything had. It was just a deflation problem, Precisely. deflation phenomenon. Precisely. So essentially, what we did was set up a system where annually, basically, what we do is the change in food, basically from one year to the next, basically changes the aggregate supply of shares. That's how the entire system was set up. And that's what you've been so, doing since was, from the beginning. That's, yep. That's, so that's essentially the the objective largely to keep prices stable. Now, to go to the second point that you mentioned, there are times where you want prices to change, okay? And that's if relative demand and supply conditions change. And you mentioned the financial crisis. We set this system up to essentially keep all else equal prices relatively flat. Prices have remained pretty flat, except for what happened in 2008. In 2008, there was a huge shock where demand went way up at food banks, supply went down at food banks. And what we see in the data is that prices went up by about – the price level went up by about 25 percent. Wow. And did relative prices change much, by the way? If you, if you looked at a time series of cereal or uh, correcting for inflation, was there much of a change in relative prices of, of goods over the, over, this time, over the whole thing? Okay, that, that has yet to be tested. I have recently got all the data on the auctions that we have had. Let me tell you my guess. My guess is that the – relative price of low quality food went up for the following reason, which is the way it works in a typical year is that the people who have loads of other food only focus on the expensive stuff. I think what happened during the financial crisis, and this is part of the reason the price level rose, is that a lot of these larger food banks felt they didn't have enough of the staples, so they started to bid on the less expensive stuff. So my guess is relative price is compressed, but pure guesswork at this stage. Uh, is there a reason that you just wrote about this? It happened a while back, this change. If I have it right, it was 2005. That's this correct. is so interesting, right, uh, especially to economists, but I think even to uh, normal human beings. Did Is there a reason it's taken a while to write about it? Or did I miss something? Am I late, just late to no, the party? No, no, it was, it was something I had always meant to do, but, you know – Something always managed to get in the way, and largely it was one of my colleagues persuading me. <laughs> Truthfully, I, people persuaded me on the following basis, which is, say, look, this might be useful for other people. Sure. 
And essentially, that's what I found persuasive. So I ended up getting around to it. So other than, you know, me being distracted by the other kind of work that I tend to do, I, I have no other excuse, I'm afraid, Russ. Do you see, that's okay. Do you see any um, any direct applications you think might be happening uh, in response to this? Are there other areas where uh, things are being given away that might be allocated more effectively through a, uh, a created market? Not yet, to be honest. I mean, this is, let me give you one thought I have, but um, it's probably four weeks since I wrote the paper, six weeks since I wrote the paper. So probably these things take a little time. The, the one case I think that is of interest, to me at least, is remember the piece that we have been involved in. The piece that we have been involved in is getting food from a manufacturer through the intermediary of Feeding America to the Chicago Food Depository. The Chicago Food Depository, as one example, the Chicago Food Depository then has to decide how it gives food to your local church, your local community center, your local yeah, school. Yeah, sure. And one of the things I mentioned then, yes, exactly. And they do not use this fake money at that decentralized level. And I actually think it could be useful. I mean, one of the things, I don't think you want to get individual churches and food banks bidding on stuff, but one thing that could be done is that you essentially set up these fake money accounts and you give them credit cards. They come in and they basically buy how much broccoli they want, how much chicken they want at the local food depository. The way it's done in many food depositories, it varies, but the way it's done in many food depositories is you actually pay real money to get the food. Now it's usually subsidized and some things are free, but you actually use real money. And part of the problem that Feeding America always had with real money is they were afraid that it was the better off neighborhoods that would be better off at fundraising than the ones that are in the poorer neighborhoods. So they felt it could be really counteracting their desire to allocate based on need. I don't know how substantive that problem is at a local level, but I think it's at least something worth sort of considering. Of course, all of this is an application of what Hayek called the information problem, that it's very difficult to know what people actually want. We're, we're talking about food banks. Of course, taking down the next level would be people, the people who actually yep. eat the food or take the food from the food bank. And, um, you know, we live in next, a we live in a, uh, we live in a welfare system that has a lot of uh, in-kind uh, attributes. Yeah, yeah and uh, a lot of people, going back to Milton Friedman and others, have suggested, let's just give them money. And it's, of course, a big trend in uh, international development, fighting poverty, mm -hmm. that the failure of a lot of other systems is encouraging people to say, let's start just giving our cash. What, do you have any thoughts on that? At a local level, I would say in the... the following sense, which is there's a lot of disagreement. Actually, this is this actually post-dates our change in the following sense. So I, I use the food banks as a, as a metaphor for a larger point, which is there's a big um, disagreement among the food banking community now over the issue of nutrition. So Probably over the last four or five years, and most food banks agree on most things, but one of the things they disagree on is the extent to which you should only give out food which has high nutritional value. And I think a lot of it, this comes down to there's a degree of paternalism, which is we ain't giving you fizzy drinks because fizzy drinks aren't good for you. And yet, on the other hand, there's a lot of people that say, look, most people go buy fizzy drinks. Why shouldn't they have them too? You know, people want these things. They should be offered them. So I would say that, you know, the, the, the local example that I'm kind of dealing with it sort of has that problem or that, that problem may not be the wrong word, but that discussion, I would say, that's currently going on. But there have been quite a few food banks that have sort of changed their demands. And this is one of the things the market system here allows you to do, which would have been really difficult to do under the centralized system, which is how do we make sure that certain food banks get more nutritious food and other food banks say, look, I just want to make sure that somebody has food when they go to school in the morning. And I think one of the things the market allows you to do is sort on that dimension as well. I just want to mention before we close that uh, this whole experience reminds me uh, a little bit of the um, uh, Radford article we've talked about on Econ Talk before. I'll put a link up to that episode. I think it was with Mike Munger uh, about the uh, use of currency and allocation in a prisoner war camp. Uh, oh, yeah. It's a wonderful paper to go back and read after you've listened to this episode or go back and listen to that episode of Econ Talk. I'm going to close with a question about um, your personal experience. Having 
gone through this, which is a lot of hours of work. <clears throat> there was a lot of uncertainty whether it was going to happen at all. It finally happened. Uh, it seems to be working, seems to be working well. How uh, rewarding has that been for you? And has it changed your views on markets or prices in any significant way? So let me do the personal piece first. Um, I think I learned an enormous amount, okay, about myself mm -hmm. um, through this process. I have sort of really kind of sketched over one piece of it, which is it took us a year of meetings to sort this out. And, and I think one of the things, and I really credit one of my colleagues here, Harry Davis, for this, which is this would never have happened if we hadn't listened. And I think to a large extent, I learned to listen during this entire process. The second thing I will say is that I feel, I actually feel extremely lucky that I was involved in this for the following reason, which is many, many people donate their time. Millions and millions of people donate their time to all sorts of worthy causes. The thing that I got lucky about is I managed to donate my time for something where I think I had a comparative advantage. Yeah. You know, I could use my skills to leverage to something that's actually been, we, I should say, used our skills to leverage something that's been valuable. And in that sense, you know, it sort of oriented my choices from then on, which is these are the kind of things I should do. Things that I can do better than other people or relative to my own inadequacies in other areas, I should do. So I think it's been extremely valuable to me in that sense. About the merits of a market, you know, I'm a faculty member at the U of C, so I may not be the most representative person on the planet here, but um, I actually think I learned that with a relatively small number of tweaks, one can simultaneously satisfy some kind of efficient allocation with some desire to allocate based on a metric of need. You know, through the use of allocating more shares to the food banks that have the more poor, through all of these safeguards. You know, if you had told me 10 years ago that it would have been as seamless as it appears to be, I probably wouldn't have believed you. I mean, I fully expected some really unintended consequence to wriggle out that we'd have to like change something. But I've been surprised that, you know, it seems to have gone as smoothly as it has. My guest today has been Candice Prendergast of the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. Candice, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. It's been my pleasure, Russ. Thanks for having me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.